Hey, Ben. Kick it, G. Let's get into it. One, two, three. Well, and welcome back to My Whiskey Den. This week, we are lucky enough to have Russ with us. He's the marketing director for Great Lakes Distillery down in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin's oldest distillery that we have ever had. Uh, obviously, we've had some before, but in the reincarnation um, of the distilleries here, they laid a lot of groundwork for other distilleries to kind of pop up and, and work their way in. So we're happy to have you, Russ. Thanks for stopping in. No problem at all. What, uh, as far as you guys here, Mike, Ben, and, and, and Russ, what are you guys all drinking tonight? And everyone in the chat, why don't you punch in what you're, uh, you're drinking as well, too? Because we kind of usually start off that way. I'm drinking my favorite whiskey from our distillery. This is our blended Kinnikinick whiskey aged in a spent bulky porter barrel uh, for an additional two years. So I'll be sipping on this. And when I feel like not drinking all of that because that's all I have. I'm going to switch over to E.H. Taylor Small Batch. Nice. I found it in the basement yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, what, are you, what are you two drinking? Yeah, I'm in the same direction. The Kinnikinick, the Batch 76. Uh, we'd reviewed that last night and I loved it. So uh, sticking with that for now. Yeah, same here. That's a that's a that's a really great whiskey. Yeah. We enjoyed that quite a bit. And I I'm doing it too because I do not have the special release one, but I I will be. We like I said, we have a our agent Jonathan Friday who picked us up a bear, uh, bottle when he was down in Milwaukee, and we kind of we made fun of him a little bit because his name does sound like he's like a fake mm -hmm. made up like mm -hmm. private investigator. <laughs> 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 so we'll uh, we were happy to get him involved in that um but uh so he was happy to happy enough to sneak that in um so russ we usually kind of start a little bit further back in the mindset of stuff you guys there's a lot of age spirits that great lakes Dist distillery does what was one of what was the first spirit that kind of got you excited about drinking i know you're not always supposed to address it that way but you know <laughs> um I mean, personally, uh, the first thing I really started drinking was beer, like when I turned 2021, 20, that sort of area. Uh, hard spirits, though, probably whiskey was the first one that really interests me that I got into. Um, that's way back when, uh, at the time, and probably still now, my favorite band was Local H, and the lead singer would drink Maker's Mark on stage, and I, what's this? He's drinking it. I like his music. Uh, what's that? So then I started into that, and uh, that just kind of snowballed into where I am now. With oh, I, I, I dig that. That, like I was saying, I uh, we were talking before on the stream. I kind of, I kind of had that same thing where it was uh, going to shows, kind of expanded my whiskey experience by kind of seeing what other people were drinking. So I kind of, I kind of went down that same road as well too. Um, so how did you end up coming to work with um, Great Lakes Distillery? And was there a release that they had that kind of got you excited to want to work with them? Or, sorry. Yeah, this goes way back to like probably 2007. So just a quick background. Uh, the distillery started producing in 2006. So right around then, the box came out shortly after that, the gin. And I don't remember exactly when this was, but the gin was already out. I was at a bar and there was a sign on the wall that said, try Ray Horse Gin made in Milwaukee. And I laughed, I laughed quite heartily at <laughs> gin made in Milwaukee. Uh, but then I'm like, okay, give me one of those in tonic. And then I had uh, another four. And then I went home <laughs> and I emailed the owner, I'm like your gin's awesome. I want to print t-shirts for you. and. Guy Ray Horster invited me over the next day. I, I had a screen printing company at the time. Um, yeah, Guy Ray Horster invited me over the next day. I saw the facilities, started printing shirts for them, started hanging out more, started working events, started working one day a week, started working two days a week, and now I'm marketing. 
So. Nice. No, that's a, a real that's normal. Everyone has that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, that's a, that's a, that's what I kind of I didn't know if that would happen because I think that happens like a lot of times as you try something and you you kind of get an affinity for it and then you you almost wish you could be involved in, in, and I love that you kind of started working in kind of printing shirts and stuff because that's a great way to do it. I we always like swag here because that. Um, <laughs> It, it is neat. Sometimes, just like like bottle design, sometimes that will pull your attention if you haven't had something, and you're like, "Well, what's this about?" And then then you get into it another way. Um, so yeah, that's that is sweet. Um, even do you have like a little bit of history about Great Lakes Distillery? Um, like I was saying, I know it did kind of start like uh, was it one of the original ones. Um, do you know any of the like groundwork it kind of laid for the for the other ones or kind of the oops or hurdles it had to jump to get actually started oh uh, yeah well the short version is if you want the full version come take my tour if i'm ever allowed to get it again but uh no uh, <laughs> the short version is guy ray our star owner uh sold his shares of a multimedia duplication company and had a stack of money and kind of was at the bar one day he was looking at the back bar of the menu or some such thing and noticed that you could buy beer from all over Milwaukee and all over the state. You could get Lakefront, you could get MKE, you could get Capital, uh, Central Waters, all that. But all the vodka was from Eastern Europe. All the rum was from the Caribbean. All the gin was from the UK. Uh, why? Why couldn't there be everything made locally? Uh, he was a home winemaker, home uh, brewer, things like that. So he looked into it and thankfully decided, yeah, let's, let's go for it. Let's I'm going to start a distillery, a small micro distillery in Milwaukee. It uh, wasn't that easy, though. It was easy federally, no problem. You fill out a form, you get your federal distillation permit and uh, producer number and all that. But the state of Wisconsin, uh, <laughs> what, what's a distillery? There hadn't been an active distillery here since at least 1920, so they didn't really have any idea, you know, zoning uh regulations taxes all that stuff so it took them about 18 months to figure all that out and then once we did we opened up and we became the first so every other distillery in the state it's a lot easier because they had to figure out everything for us to open yeah i, I remember i just remember from talking to other people how kind of thankful they were that you guys did that because there was a lot of pushback in other areas and stuff of trying to actually just just get the whole thing set up so it was nice to have it kind of like a, a precursor layout so i know there's a lot of other people that really thank you guys for doing that um so i, I knew that was kind of a big deal with that um, i will add this i i'm 90 percent sure this one's true uh 45th parallel in new richmond wisconsin they make mm -hmm. a good product uh they were hemming and hawing about being in Minnesota or being in Wisconsin. But when they opened up, it was like a thousand dollars a year permit to distill in Wisconsin and ten thousand a year in Minnesota. So they decided to be in New Richmond, Wisconsin instead of just whatever is right across the border. Just on the border of it. Yeah. And we were uh I'm not sure that's true. We'll, we'll we'll take it. It sounds true to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I know we're, uh, we did a review on something from Panther Dis Distillery, Distillery over there. Yeah. And if you, my one friend was my actually my bookkeeper from work went over there and she she picked up a bottle, and she could only get like a three seven five and one of them from the distillery, and that's all you could get. And I was like, that is sad. I'm like, for as much as distilleries are becoming like a a destination like vacation destination when you're doing stuff to only be able to pick up a you know a small one one bottle and have to go to a liquor store to find it someplace else i i kind of find minnesota's liquor laws a little dampening to be polite <laughs> every state has one or two laws that are just head scratchers even i mean wisconsin too just you can't buy most places, beer or liquor after 9 p.m. unless you're at a bar. That's just weird. But it's, it's they, the powers that be want you to drink in the bar, not at <laughs> home, because the people, powers that be. Yeah. <laughs> that, that extra tier wants to make some money off the whole thing yeah. at that point, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
So um, you guys being the oldest distillery in Wisconsin, right? All right. There's been a lot of growth that from my position, especially through Patrick, I've gotten to learn and see a lot from that area. Uh, where do you see kind of the market headed within the next five to 10 years in Wisconsin with, with whiskey, with distilling? Hold on one second. Yeah. Someone's outside my house. One second, please. <laughs> <laughs> See, that, that's the excitement that happens when you're doing yeah. something live. No big deal. With that. It's just my brother-in-law. No big deal. Okay. <laughs> um, the future is, is shrinking. It's localizing. It's going to be like uh, brewing almost where you need to take care of your city, your neighborhood, and your tasting room. That's where you will exist. When we started out, uh, we peaked at about, I think we were distributed in up to almost 30 states. And we're down to one now. Because back in the day, Missouri didn't have any micro distillery. So any micro distillery was neat, different, wild. But now, no one in Missouri will give a crap about our vodka because there's 35 distilleries in Missouri making vodka. So it's all about taking care of your own, finding your fan base, and treating them well. And yeah, take care of your backyard. Uh, it's going to be the future for any distillery, really. I don't see how anyone could, without many, many millions of dollars, really uh, break out and put a dent in the nationwide scheme. Because uh, more than ever, it's it's drink local, it's be local, it's eat local. The local movement is really happening. and. Mm -hmm. That needs to be embraced. Yeah, and it's good to do that because it does, it does create kind of that a nice feel to it. But like it, like with beer, we were we were discussing that with someone else a couple weeks ago. It's it was almost like what happened with beer in Wisconsin, where like you said, it became before you could get stuff out to Madison and other places. Now it's like if you're in Milwaukee, you're drinking mostly Milwaukee beers, uh, and then just just kind of sectioned off. Um, but I know you guys do have like decent distribution in the state because I can find some of your stuff up here, which I can't always do with everybody. And a lot of the stuff is usually very reasonably priced when I do find it. So that's another thing I appreciate appreciate about you guys. Like the Kinnikinnick I found for, I think this was like $33 when I found it. So I'm, I'm never going to, could be priced much higher, though I don't want you to jump on that <laughs> statement. <laughs> it shouldn't be much more than that. Um, but um, that, like in the Still and Oak series too, where you guys have uh, the the bourbon and the the rye in that, um, you guys actually have quite a few kind of core releases as far as I kind of look at it because you you have this like fourteen uh, core products. Yeah, I was gonna say it's pretty solid. <laughs> even just with the bourbon and whiskey, is you have the Still and Oak series whiskey, the rye. Uh, the Knickknicks out all the time. Um, I know the Menominee Valley was this year's 10 year, but I think, and the repeal uh, reserve straight rye are both kind of like once in single, a while. When yeah. Can. The like, repeal rye is every December 5th. Mm hmm. That comes and I, out. That's another one. That. That's uh, one. I don't have a bottle to show you, but that's uh, uh, one of my favorite things about that product is since we don't distribute it. We don't put a barcode on it. So it's one of the few liquor bottles you'll ever see with no barcode because there's no reason to have a barcode because we sell it out of one room and know what it costs. Yeah, and, and it's and it's usually you guys have like a party that night or something from what I gather. And it's, it's just, I don't know, I, I was jealous because we don't have, we have nine breweries but no distillery. Well, we have a distillery but they don't do any whiskey. Yeah. Um, well, I, I asked them about it, so I don't know if they're really going to lean into it or not. I was like, you should really think about going this way, being the only one here, but we'll see. Um, but, yeah, I was going to say, I just like the whole idea of, like, pro prohibition, you know, gets repealed, the name of it. It kind of has it has a whole nice fun evening to it, you know, pick up a bottle and go home. And you guys, I, I was, you guys sell out pretty fast that night with, with what that is. About a month. We sell more than half of it that night, but then usually – It'll last a little while, almost till Christmas, um, for people to buy bottles. Still this year took a little longer because um, the 10 year single mall was on the shelf at the same time as the repeal, and we had a lot more repeal than normal. That that changes how many bottles we have each year, too. Yeah. 
So the, 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 there's 14 whiskeys in the core line, you said? Uh, 14 core products. Or core products. Yeah, three so, of them are well, I, I mean, not necessarily out of those, but what, what whiskey do you want Great Lakes to make? What's your whiskey? Um, I've always wanted to do um, the local malt house, uh, Brees Ingredients out of Chilton, Wisconsin, makes or produces grain, and it's used nation and even worldwide. And they have a cherry wood smoked malt. And I want a 100% cherry wood smoked malt. Uh, with me. but it would be insanely expensive and insanely low yield. Um, so I don't think it will ever happen, but that's my idea. <laughs> I like the way you think, though. That sounds yeah, absolutely yeah. delicious. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's something about that. Uh, one is very expensive, and yeah, there's something about the, it's, it'd be such a low yield, it would cost so much to make so little, and we don't even know if it would taste as good as I think it would in my head. Yeah. But yeah, that's I don't know. I, I I'm tempted by it. Just just the thought of it sounds it, just unique. Kind of the cherry wood smoke sounds kind of exciting. I just kind of like the Coquigan where they use like mesquite wood. Just different woods that you're using kind of add that flavor. Usually do have you can tell like you know a couple years in where it really kind of starts taking effect. So that does sound wonderful but i do i do understand completely what you're talking about where you're like it's not going to pan out 100 percent the way i want it. <laughs> i want it to as far as like like you said yield we've played around with other smoked malts from them and, and some chip um, excuse me some of the cherry wood um it just doesn't hold up the barrel aging okay. sadly uh, maybe we didn't use enough but either way it, it hasn't been something we're able to try yet. But hmm. I always have um, Now, I know that you guys, with the Kinnikinick in the past, you guys had done a finish where it was a, it was a wine finished barrel. Are you guys thinking about doing anything like that? Anytime we get a weird barrel, we'll put something in it. So we have a barrel broker who's local who brokers barrels. And he might call and say, hey, I got a spent port barrel. I got a spent sherry barrel. And we'll take it, but we're not seeking it out. It's far too expensive. If you really want something and request it, it becomes expensive. Yeah. So we're not opposed to trying anything. It's just it kind of has to fall into our lap for it to be worth it. Well, and it kind of feels uh, like it's more part of the grand plan when that happens, too. Yeah. Because you know? yeah. <laughs> we, I think we were talking about that with uh, the Knickadick, if it was – I think we were talking about that last night with a port finish on it or something like that. We're like, wonder. I'm like, it's fantastic the way it is, but I wonder what would happen if you if you did this or added like that extra little layer of notes to it. But uh, but the uh, cigar kind of tobacco flavor on it was really neat. How, how that kind of dropped off, kind of came yeah. in at the end on that one. Yeah, we've done a Cabernet Sauvignon and a Cabernet Franc finish on the Kinnikinick. Both those were quite nice, but I still prefer the Baltic Porter. I just haven't had it yet, so now you got me all excited about <laughs> trying to trying to find one. So, th so that'll be on the list of things I'm looking at. Um, yeah. So, so the question about, about the, the marketing part of your job. Yeah. What, uh, how... Is there a, is there like a set percentage that you know is is uh, person to person versus traditional you know media marketing or is it changing or for us it's mostly person to person yeah, we are so different in that we are trying to be a bar we're trying to be a distillery and we want you to buy our spirits at other bars and we want you to buy our spirits at the liquor store. So there's no uniform plan to, we want you to do this. So it's weird. You do what you can. Um, so much of the, our marketing budget is paying people to uh, give samples at grocery stores around town. So, and that's very unconventional to be a high percentage of your marketing budget, but that's what works best. If someone's at a store pouring samples that could be an additional 20, 25 bottles sold at the store, mm -hmm. which is great. So is, you know, giving to it. it. It's, we're trying to do everything 
which is fine. So it, it's very untraditional in that sense, where there's not a unified, we want this to happen. It's more of just about, at least in my opinion, I don't care where it happens, get people to try the product. That's the most important thing. If we don't make a good product, it doesn't matter. And if no one gets to try it, not the problem. So whatever it takes to get people to try the product is kind of my approach. And just now when you mentioned selling beer at the distillery, I, is that like another hoop that you kind of had to hop through? Because I know that... That was a weird one. Uh, we're... It, it's with the state of Wisconsin. There are yeah. some different levels of what kind of bar you are. Are you this? Are you that? We're a tasting room with a beer license, but we can't sell anyone else's beer. So even if we wanted to sell a Jack and Coke, we couldn't. Because we can't sell Jack because we don't make Jack. But we have a beer license so we can sell beer even if we don't make it and that's just one of the many 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 it's, i just know it was it, it's tough to kind of add some other stuff to it when you're just kind of just doing your product and all stuff a lot of times adding other people's stuff can be can be a hurdle sometimes so that I, I was just happy to hear that because it does kind of add a little bit more to the experience and if there might be someone there that just doesn't i mean hard to say what you said like 14 products in the core line yeah. but someone that just wants a beer that's along for the ride that day or oh, yeah. you know is just that's coming up that's why we looked at it because yeah you'll get a group of people who go out they are going to tour lakefront mob craft great lakes distillery and hit up the cider bar and they'll be an hour at each place and someone might not like something so we right now have four uh different local beers just for those people so that's what we try and do we'll have a lakefront brew a mob craft a mke and uh i think we had a good city for a while so yeah the limited beer we have is all local it's all canned it's just very um okay you want a beer that's fine it's local here you go enjoy yeah that's cool. I, I dig that. That's actually, it, it's a really good idea. And like you said, it is, if you're trying to kind of corner the local uh, local market or aspect to it, that's just another way to pull it in where you feel like you're inviting the more of the neighborhood to be a part of the experience. So I dig that or, or city. So that's awesome. Oh, excuse me. Um, before the stream, we were talking, or you were telling us a little bit about some of the gin and things you're doing there. What's what's kind of the next frontier for you guys, distillery wise? Um, would it be you know kind of the gin projects you're talking about, or, or what, what do you see coming? Things you'd like to tackle? Um, making as much whiskey as we can. That'll be <laughs> great. Uh, we had a really successful release of our cask strength bourbon. So we want to do a cast strength rye. We want to bring back the cast strength bourbon. Uh, right now, it's just getting enough whiskey laid down to do things like that. Uh, and then whatever else comes along, all our weird brandy is based on surplus, kind of like barrels, whatever falls in our lap. So we have a local fruit market, Pete's Fruit Market. They sell produce very, very cheap because it's very, very ripe and it's about to go bad. Uh, that's perfect for us because sometimes they will have a pallet of blueberries that are about to go bad that they can't sell quick enough. So they'll call and say, hey, you want this pallet of blueberries for 18 cents a pound? And that's why we have blueberry brandy. Okay. So if they call tomorrow with a pallet of mangoes about to go bad, we'll make mango brandy. But yeah, outside of that, it's just laying down whiskey as much as we can. And we are dabbling and thinking about making a corn whiskey, but I don't know if that'll happen. Do you know about how many barrels you guys have in the warehouse or, you, or about how many you're laying down, like say per year right now? We're about 300 in storage. And then we're probably laying down, I mean, lately about three a week. So okay. almost 150, 200 a year laying okay. down. Wow. That's cool. That's, that's a good, like you said, you want to keep stepping up with it. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. And keeping busy, especially with all the other things that you're doing as well too. So I dig that. So what are you a sucker for in marketing? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I hate exclamation points, but I use them. Both. <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> I like things that are unapologetically bold, but not craft. Uh, I like basic things. Uh, I, I will tell you my favorite commercials of all time. Maybe that will help. Uh, the old High Life commercials, uh, they're called, I believe, the Earl Morris High Life commercials. Mm -hmm. I believe he wrote them. They were very basic. Uh, you'd have to look them up, but they were 15 to 30 seconds. Uh, a very drab shooting, but um, just, it was just, High Life's good. And that's was the whole message of the commercial. Uh, one of the best ones being it was a shot of a refrigerator, an old school refrigerator with the handle on it running in a garage. And the voiceover was, you hear that? That's the sound of one friend keeping another friend cold. Drink high <laughs> and I love that. That whole campaign to me was perfect. So I don't know the exact name for that sort of thing. But. No, but I, I dig that because sometimes you feel like they're trying to, like with PR and other things, they're trying to spin it so much or kind of play into it so hard that you're like, I get I get kind of irritated at some point where I was like, yeah, Neh. and I they know this. I'm sometimes I'm a sucker for a weird bottle. I know I shouldn't be, but every now and then there'll be a weird bottle when I walk past and I'm like, yeah. I'm, that's at I, least cool enough to keep, you know? Like you yeah. can, <laughs> that could be a decanter. I don't yeah. care what it tastes like. Uh, I've definitely bought bottles like that. Mm -hmm. No, uh, a good example is um, the Hibiki bottle is gorgeous. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so someday if it's ever affordable, I will <laughs> buy one just as a decanter. Oh, uh, uh, gunpowder gin. Kind of has that Hibiki feel. It's a blue bottle. It's cylindrical with all the kind of, not notches, but it's similar, mm -hmm. but it's blue. And I bought that gin just because of the bottle. I, like I said, I do, I do the same thing every now and then. So, it, and that's part of marketing. But like I said, I think I'm more like you, where you want something that's a little plain, where it just says, "Hey, I'm delicious," you know, like to give it a yeah. whirl. <laughs> this, this is our product. We think it tastes good. You should try it. That, that's, that's all I need. <laughs> and it, it's, it's it's like quietly bold and like just like you know like having a lot of backing in, in your thought of it. Just like, just give it a taste. I think, yep. I think, I think we'll win just by you having a drink. Just give yep. it a whirl. So that, that's awesome. Mm. So other than the, the whiskey, which it sounds like you're kind of, you, you're like enjoying more. So is, and obviously the gin, since you mentioned, is there a different something, uh, something from the core lineup that you, I never want to say someone that you something that they like the most, but something you're really proud of that that the distillery is putting out. Yeah, our citrus honey vodka is so misunderstood and underrated, and that's one of the things you have to try. So it's a vodka that is distilled with honey and with lemons. So it's not super sweet and it's not super tart. It's subtle. It's bright. It tastes like citrus. It's delicious with seltzer, but you just see it on the shelf and you go, oh, a citrus vodka. I've had a dozen of those. So it's not until you try it that you go, oh, wow, this is different. And it's that and seltzer is the perfect summertime drink, but we just don't sell a lot of it because it's, it's on the shelf and it's not something people will try on a whim. No, like you said, that's what something where if you have someone there giving out samples that someone, you know, if they had it all of a sudden might pop to them and they'll be like, well, let's pick up two or three yep. extra bottles for something that they're doing. Cause I think that when we were at this, Mike and I were at distill America, um, it kind of, you kind of split up, you do your own thing. And at the end of the night, I'll kind of run people between the six, seven things. If they haven't had that, you know, everyone will taste of like, Oh, come over here. Have you tried this? Have you tried this? And then like, Maybe you shouldn't try ten things right at the end, but you know that happens. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole other problem. Uh, but that's where I was going to say we we did find like a uh, like a central vodka from uh, I think it was out in, in Denver someplace that I was uh, my wife found it. She, she's like, this is actually something you know I could drink, and I was going to say, and I don't 
I don't remember. I don't think she probably would have tried the one from yours if you had it there, because I know I think it was mainly whiskey. I was pushing on her at that point. Um, that's my fault. <laughs> Um, but she'll usually come back and find something. And she, when she had that, she's we. she had a grandma that was known as Grandma on the Rocks. And yeah. <laughs> so she was like, I I could drink this. This could this could make me Grandma on the Rocks. And I was <laughs> like, All right, well, okay, now I got to see what this is like. And, and yeah, and it was, it was it was surprisingly really, really good. Um, and that with the honey that you're mentioning in yours, I'm pretty intrigued by that. So I might have to have to find a bottle of that just because it's got – those are two nice, really kind of sweet, light flavors that, like you said, can can be blended with a lot of things. That'll be, I don't know, I'm intrigued by that. I like it. <laughs> so, what what makes what makes Great Lakes unique amongst all whiskey? Um, I will say this about every distillery anywhere: you cannot make the same thing as anyone else. So we're unique because our still is our still. Our yeast and ambient yeast is our ambient yeast our distillers our distiller our barrels are our barrels our climates our climate so without trying anything at all we are unique for that reason uh, above and beyond that uh, the bourbon is very barley heavy which is different in the whiskey world so our bourbon's about 20 percent barley which is pretty high and then our rye is 100 percent rye and it's 20% malted rye. So I think most 100% rye is like 90, 95% unmalted uh, or completely unmalted with enzymes. We use 20% malted barley in our rye. Uh, the Connecticut is weird because it's, I think only two other places are blending in-house product with source products. But at the end of the day, it's different because we make it and no one else can. But that's true with any distillery. But I did not know that about the the rye and the other one because I'm I, I like a little bit more of a barley kind of note in, in some of some of the things we have. So we'll be I just didn't we'll usually pick up a couple bottles like I said we'll release one or two videos later this week that you got that uh, that you guys did. But coming up we'll be trying some of the other ones that you had as well too. I just didn't. I'll, I'll just be honest. I don't have enough money to buy everyone's bottles all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just happens. So, so we'll usually pick up a couple and we'll come back to it. Um, but yeah, I was going to say we, I think Mike and I had the, I, I know you guys had the rye and the bourbon there. I don't remember if you had the cast strength bourbon at the still America, but I remember right. the, having the bourbon and that was really, really tasty. Mm -hmm. I was going to say I was I was a fan of that just because it had a, that deeper, richer kind of feel to it. You probably like um, that barley content then. I do. I was going to say I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of that, so I was happy about that. Yeah, I didn't know bourbon, about the... The bourbon's roughly, no, uh 70% <laughs> corn, 20% barley, 10% rye. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I know there's a place in town where I can pick that one up, so we'll, we'll, be, we'll be trying that in the near future. I'm down to the distillery in a month. We'll do the same thing live in in next to each other i can handle i can handle that as long as they let us out in that time frame yeah. that's, that, that's all i want to do it would be nice to travel again just to get out to a couple places but that's the only kind of nice thing about some of the, the setup we were doing i'm like well this kind of lends itself to be stuck in your house which isn't great but it, it works this way <laughs> but yeah get, getting to see it i know you guys were uh you were doing on on your facebook um some actual basically like a mini tour of the distillery and some other stuff um, that you were doing there. And I appreciate that just as, as a, you know, a consumer and being able to see that like be next stage behind it, where, like you said, for a month or two months, you might not be able to get that. So um, I appreciate that series that you're doing with the distillery and kind of explaining what's going on there. Uh, we dabbled in that until I lost my cameraman who got laid off, but oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> Or have cocktail videos too. Uh, so yeah, that was fun. Uh, I might do another one kind of light, but yeah. Uh, my uh, good friend Brendan, who was our bar manager, okay, we were able to keep, keep him busy for like two weeks after this started, but then it just became not enough to do. So yeah. he got laid off. He'll be back though. And he was kind of a necessary part of holding the camera, helping and things like that. Oh. Uh, Cocktail videos are coming soon and trying to do some sort of tour thing some more. I'm doing more things like this with uh, various places. So. 
Yeah. Well, it's, it's getting that extra kind of behind the behind the scenes feel that you would get on a tour that you we can't get right now. So, yeah. um, let's see here. Emily in the chat says the Honey Citrus Vodka seems built for a signature restaurant cocktail. I would I would tend to agree with that. Yeah. I if I could find a bottle, I might have to look into that. Because that, that does sound pretty sweet. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, a little indigestion from earlier tonight. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. curious, sitting here looking at that nice liquor collection behind you, what's some personal favorites you got back there? Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right. Now the the thing is, is can we tempt him to drink those two? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have two whiskeys that I rank one hundred out of one hundred. They, I will never have a better whiskey. I'm not saying wow. other things won't be as good, but I don't think anything will ever be better. And also a fun story to tell. Uh, I'll start with this one. Hard bag alligator. My mm. favorite hard bag ever. Had a sample somewhere. Fell in love with it. Um, back, back in the way, way long ago, uh, it was easier to do things like this. And I wanted to get a bottle of alligator. And I found someone who was willing to trade for a bottle of George T. Stag. So oh, nice. I traded a bottle of Stag for a bottle of alligator. The time they were worth equal value, but I am quite happy because I got my alligator. It's open and I'm drinking it. Uh, now my 100 out of 100. First one, Parker's cognac. Oh, it is one of my absolute favorites, and I got this much left. I'll drink a little. <laughs> that one's about ready to kill, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And then let the tears flow. <laughs> I say that's the hard part with that sometimes yeah. is, is, is pouring that last one, but you're like, you know what? I still want to come back to this. Yeah. This is... <laughs> now, I don't get any cognac finish to it. I was never, never with that. Really? Just the best bourbon I've ever had. I've had the Parker's, the uh, Curacao barrel finish. That orange liqueur, um, that added some some interesting, I don't know, accented the citrus and the orange oil notes you usually get out of a bourbon. Mm -hmm. Really nice, but you know, yeah, that it was pretty good. But that's the only Parker's I've I've had the pleasure of trying. That one's a good one. Um, there there's been some good ones. It's the it's the the problem with the the situation right now. Like they're all worth trying, and yeah. everyone should be able to try them. They're not all knockouts yeah yeah um, yeah I, but you know that's the way it goes the, the alligator i i agree with completely that is a is a, a fantastic dram i i have only had it twice but i i loved it both times so <laughs> yeah you got me excited i almost got up and tried to go you know, i only have a quarry here but i was i was tempted to go grab an art bag just 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 when you started i'm like yep you know what i could handle one of those right now yeah. i think i have uh i have uh, i think Ubedel in the basement those are my only art bags at the moment uh, i do love some art bag uh, we had whispering jeff he wanted to know about your absence if you guys do that whispering jeff yeah because we live in milwaukee I'm gonna guess so because he's he brought up another thing about uh, how the pump uh, how pumpkin is used in uh, your lakefront brewery as a base. I think I know Whispering Jeff, or I, I, know of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, absinthe, thats a fun one. There's only one country in the entire world that has a legal definition for what absinthe is or is not, and that is Switzerland. So anywhere else in the world, it's absent if you say it is absent. That includes France, that includes America. Our That's absent sad. is roughly based on a uh, French distiller's manual from the 19th century. We kind of modernized it. But if you say absent, you're thinking of something that kind of tastes like black licorice. 
and that comes from anise and fennel using the recipe. Our absinthe, we have two or three right now. Uh, the base of all is strongly anise, wormwood, fennel. And then we have a green absinthe finished with lemon balm and hyssop. We have a red absinthe finished with hibiscus and cassia. And then we have something called black synth, which is the green and red mixed together. And then we add a uh, element of a tree uh, called urcha, which is one of the only natural ways to turn something black. It came out on Halloween at 66.6% ABV, and it's tasty. They got them all. Go ahead. There it is. I was going to say, the, the green one sounded exciting, and I'm not an anise person, so I was... Black synth. Really, the black synth? I like the bottle. I dig that. Yeah. I've had absinthe a few times. I've really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, probably one of those, I don't know, maybe I'm one of those guys that I, I kind of like. I say I don't like black ric licorice, but maybe I do, because I'm really enjoying rye. I like absinthe. I like cooking with fennel and things like yeah. that, so... I mean, yeah. there's black licorice candy, and then there's like herbal. Yeah, right. right. I don't necessarily like things flavored with mint, but I like a front fresh mint leaf. Like a mint julep made with yes. fresh mint or a mojito with fresh mint is completely different than, ooh, this is double mint gum. Right. So <laughs> yeah. Within that spectrum of black licorice, there's flavors and things like that. I think that yeah. I'm intrigued. Um, we'll just go to the other one. He said he was like, how how the pumpkin. Well, I was gonna say, how does the pumpkin do using the Lakefront Brewery as a base? Uh, uh, let's go. Oh, we were talking this about before. Uh, beer schnapps. Beer schnapps. So a long, long time ago, over ten years ago, when we were starting out and we had time to play around, uh, someone we don't know who. It was either someone from Great Lakes Distillery or someone from Lakefront Brewery said, what if we put our beer in your still? What would happen? And um, the next day, a bunch of buckets of pumpkin lager came from Lakefront Brewery, got thrown in our still, and we ran it. That tasted pretty good. So every year we make pumpkin spirit, which is Lakefront Brewery pumpkin lager, distilled and barrel aged. So with the beer schnapps, it's almost like a whiskey. The only thing is, since they ferment actual pumpkin for the beer, we can't call it whiskey. It has to be 100% grain fermentation. Right. Mm. But it's essentially a whiskey. It tastes like a spice whiskey with, you know, pumpkin pie spices, um, things like cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, things like that. Sounds like you guys have a couple of releases around Halloween then. Like, with, <laughs> yeah. just, I'm just, it sounds like there's a couple of neat things that come out right around Halloween. Uh, end of summer. Yeah, that's when you want to kind of push things. Uh, we're busiest in the summer with tourism and things like that. So, uh, also, it's we don't air condition our distillery. So, it's like 90, 95, 100 down there. So, we can start having more events mm. early fall. <laughs> well, that was one of the other questions. We didn't know if it was if it was climate controlled or not since you were going to be in Milwaukee. Uh, we heat not. a little bit in the winter. So, we heat it about 65 but yeah, summertime, it's been 100, 110, 115 down in the distillery. And that's just, it's good. That's what the barrels need. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So that was something we were discussing yesterday with our, when we did the 10 year single malt was if it had how much heat and contraction and stuff happened over the time frame of that period, uh, the 10 years. So that's awesome. <laughs> Oh, you guys, you, you mentioned it a while back about, you know, distilling some different beers and stuff. You guys ever tackle some porters or stouts or anything? Uh, that's not something I've encountered much, I don't know, if, if at all. I'm, there's I'm, a list. Beer, so I'm curious. I know one of the, we have two barrels of uh, Doppelbach <gasps> okay. that we distilled. We call it Doppelschnapps. Um, Black Friday from Lakefront. I believe is a porter. And then we distilled a lot of that recently. Yeah. We've definitely done some dark beers, but it's one of those things I don't really pay attention to until it's ready. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, spend all my day worrying about it and asking about it. So <laughs> honestly, a lot of things we put in barrels, I try to forget about. Until <laughs> our just was like we're barrel or bottling this. That That's when I start caring because, I don't want to be waiting around every day. Be like, oh, is that ready yet? Is that ready yet? 
my problem with that would be then I'd be going around to too many barrels. Like, should we try a taste today? Just yeah, we, just just to, <laughs> just to find out is is it on the right path? Is it still going in the right direction? That's why it's behind a twelve foot fence with a padlock on it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was gonna say there was from the chat they wanted to know what size still you guys have. We have a two hundred and fifty liter hybrid still. Uh, it's a pot still with an added column that can be run as either. Then we have a thousand liter pot still as well. We do all our stripping runs on our Hoga, which is a thousand liters up and over pot still. And then all our uh, spirit runs are done on our Holstein, the 250 liter one, and there's a bypass valve. So if we're running vodka, we have to run it through the column with 14 plates. If it's anything else, we run it like a pot still, bypass it, and it's a, just a smaller pot still. Okay, cool. I know I know. I had seen the one there in, in, in the tour that you had done, so I was going to say I, I should have remembered that, but I, I forgot that everyone else didn't see that. So if you right. didn't, go, go to the Facebook page. Watch the mini tour. You know, you get, 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 get acquainted with it. It's always a good thing to do. Let's so what's here. my other 100 out of 100 whiskey, you say? Yeah. All of it. Lafroy, 16-year cask strength. KNL wine select. Oh man. This is <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yep. Get <laughs> it, rock gut. Get uh, Eric to check this out. <laughs> one as well. So yeah, I'm a big sucker for Isla whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big R big guy. Those signatory bottlings I've found are absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. A few that I've had. They're oh man. It's one of those ones when you go past, like, uh, in a liquor store, you're like, I feel like I should just, you know, it, like you said, I, I like Isla as well, too, where you're like, I feel like I should try this. You know, I think there was one that was, uh, like, only, like, a four- or five-year-old Brick Lark, and I was like, hmm, I'm going to just have to try this. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I just feel like I should buy this bottle today. <laughs> but, no, a Froig 16 sounds pretty, pretty magical and Especially when they're on barrel, they had and the smile on your face says it all. The <laughs> <laughs> Freud, 1997, aged 16 years, cask handpicked by KNL Wine Merchants, distilled on April 28, 1997, modeled on. Oh, I'm tearing up. <laughs> 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 Matured in a hogshead. Cask number three three six five bottle one eighty six of two eighty three fifty five point two percent alcohol by and a nice punch on it too fifty five that's nice yeah um yeah now I feel uh, definitely after this, what I, we're done tonight I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna find some of my <laughs> my Isla whiskey like I'm just, just uh, oh uh kill home and hundred percent Isla big fan yeah, that's yep. a good one. And we have I have an STR sitting in the corner over here that I I'm gonna yeah, that's been staring at me for a while too. <laughs> you're, you're just bringing up all sorts of good good thoughts. Way to go, Russ. <laughs> Highland Park, age 25 years. That's another one. Where you're, you're right at the you're right at the tail end of killing bottles. You yeah, you could man. be a you could be a bottle killer by the end of this evening. <laughs> oh, uh, I need to be. <laughs> uh, I arranged my my collection yesterday. Uh, I'm over 500 bottles, so yes, I need. To. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna start really this time. I mean it, finishing. So, so, so there's a whole nother room that's filled up with stuff. Oh, there? there's a basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the 2019 Ardbeg Supernova. You tried that one yet? Haven't found it. I no. I I can't chase things anymore. And if someone brings it to me or my friend has it, we'll enjoy it. But just I can't go to a liquor store anymore. I'm I I can't. Yeah. <laughs> is is that you or is that someone else kind of saying maybe you shouldn't come home with another bottle? Uh, well, I don't think she can hear me right now. I don't ask her what her quilting supplies cost, so she doesn't ask me what my alcohol. Costs. 
that, that's fair. That's a good way to. That's a good way to. Cause you, you should each have your own things that you're into. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've really cut back on buying though. Actually, last year was I called it. Can you handle it? 2019. Uh, I could personal thing. I could only buy alcohol if it came in a handle. So, if I wanted something that didn't come in a handle, I had yeah, to my own supply. <laughs> So, bought a lot of gin, not a lot of whiskey. <laughs> but I killed probably about 75 bottles last year, which is good. We have a friend down in, in Texas that has quite a collection as well, too. We give him we give him guff about how, like, he's got stuff hidden in his daughter's closet behind all the clothes or something. <laughs> like, I don't know where you fit all your crap, man. It's just, it's, it's, it's hidden everywhere. Yeah. I found a bottle. Uh-oh. Ooh. My wife did hear me. <laughs> she spent uh, ninety dollars on an iron, which is fine. <laughs> but we did not mean to get you in trouble. That was that's not the intent of the show on any night. <laughs> but it makes you feel better about the alligator now, doesn't it? No. <laughs> the alligator cost. Uh, what did I pay for that today? I don't know. I have never spent more than $115 on a bottle for personal consumption. If it was a bottle split, sure, I've spent more. We bottle split a Laphroaig 25, which I don't remember how it pieced out, but if I ever bought a bottle and said, I'm going to drink this, um, I don't know, I have it right here. This is Cuervo Family Reserva. This is some of the best tequila I've ever had in my life. I don't like Cuervo. I don't like oaked agave. So this is phenomenal. I paid like 110 and thought it was too good, so I never bothered to split it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the most I've ever paid for a single bottle I was going to consume. Hmm. That, that's actually a really good way to look at it. I mean... Yeah. Because otherwise, you can it can get kind of crazy kind of quick. Um, I know a lot of times on some of the more expensive ones, I just kind of look at it as like around here in Green Bay, they'll have a a lottery like a couple times a year at Woodman's or some other place, and that's where I'm like, well, if you're at a lottery, even like the Pap event, fifteen or something is like 110, 120 bucks, and I'm like, that's doable, you know, or the you know the birthday bourbon like you were talking about how you guys how you had, I'm like, that's Wait, at least. It's a, it's affordable here, and, and I can buy it here when it pops up. But I'm like, as, as soon as you get past it, I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay two, three, five hundred dollars for a bottle just because there's so many other things to try. That for kind of sometimes forty to say sixty dollars, if you're looking at a bourbon, it has some, it has some pretty good punching weight in that range of stuff compared to what you're getting at some of the other ones. So, but yeah, was that there's like a Pappy Fifteen I picked up that way, and I was like. I just did it for the name. I should have. I was like, there was like three other bottles I should have gotten, but I was like, nope. The name came up. I was number. Well, I wasn't number two. My friend was number two. I brought a few friends to yeah. to, to sit to stand in line with me as it happened. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I was gonna say that I usually try not to spend that much either because it's hard to get. Like I find the return on investment gets kind of tough at that point where you're you know you get above one hundred and fifty or something like that. It gets. I don't know. Like I said, it it, it, it has, almost has to be like mouthgasm when you have it. Right. Like your eyes start to flutter and you start to like get it like you kind of leave your body for a split second. You know, you, your wife's asking you what happened. Like I just hold on, hold hold on a second. Um, yeah. But and for me, that's that's only really happened with uh, Isla whiskeys and. Uh, Incredibly funky Jamaican rums. Ooh. That's a whole other discussion. So you're into rums? Oh yeah. <laughs> Super nice. dirty, funky. Tastes like a hot dumpster. Uh, Ogo rums from Jamaica. So we're gonna have to look at that because we just Mike and I just reviewed uh, one of the rums. Uh, we have a couple of them we're gonna do coming up, and we have one from like Private Cheer Rum. But I, we don't have a Jamaican rum, so we might we'd have to hit you up on some names to look out for in that aspect. 
Ray and Nephew. The white rum is from Jamaica. It's super hogo forward. Uh, look up what hogo means in terms of rum. Uh, it's a very interesting taste. I find a lot of people who like Isla and, you know, the whole ashtray, smoke, all that also like really strong flavors. So they like really strong cheeses. They really like really strong flavors and uh, pot still Jamaican rum is generally in there. And it, there's nothing else like it. <laughs> <laughs> all um, right. Now I'm on the hunt. <laughs> yeah. I was say, like you, have, you have all of us being like, okay, so go like whoever can find it first go and we'll split a bottle yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what what does uh, what small craft distilleries i mean i didn't get the ones you said are your your 100 pointers and the ones ones you you cherish but what what small craft distilleries blew your doors off uh vickery out of duluth i believe minnesota they're okay. making really exceptional gin and uh uh, let's drink the other name, the caraway forward thing, not Geneva. Uh, they make another thing. It's kind of like gin, but caraway is more important than juniper. And I'm embarrassed I forgot the name of it, but they make a good version. Uh, Vickery is really good. Um, I, I can name so many that make good gins. Uh, we're talking whiskey, 45th parallel. They're coming along with some good things. I really liked Dripless Glen in Wisconsin. They're making good things. If we're calling them craft, New Riff is killing it, but I don't really know if they're craft. That's a whole other question. They're, they're at the point of like kind of making that jump like we were talking yeah. about. Yeah. Or like they, they may have been craft, but you're also at the point where you're, you're almost a national brand kind of right, like right on the doorstep of it. But they're doing it right, and everything they've met I've been pretty happy with. Um, Westland was real good. I know they got bought. I haven't had them in a while, but early Westland was quite good. I liked Ballast Point as they were coming along, but then they became Cutwater, and I haven't had anything from them. Uh, Stranahan special releases have been quite good, in my opinion, um, like the Diamond Peak and the whatnot. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, that's okay. You wrecked your brain good enough on that. Oh, you no, can't, I you, can't you, much, you, pretty much ever. Uh, Glenn something, New York. Glenn, they make Glenn Thunder, uh, three lakes, finger lakes, finger lakes. Okay. They okay. make the best corn whiskey I've ever had. I don't know if they still do, but they make Glenn Thunder, which is a corn whiskey that tastes exactly like corn. And it was cheap and unapologetically. Yeah, we distilled some corn. Here it is. It's <laughs> like 15 bucks. It was uh, um, like that. So uh, just kind of in your face with it, like, here. Uh, what is it? Is? There you go. I get it up. Uh, Bowman. Are they crap? That line is so blurry nowadays. But. Yeah, there's a few of them that are starting to kind of actually kind of punch up into that. Not quite national brand, but maybe half the country yeah. kind of release stuff. So I'm most excited about what craft distillers can do with gin because they usually use whatever's local. Like this was growing around here. This is what we could get all wine and talk about like terroir and like mm -hmm. this is what grows in this area. And we made a gin out of it, which is great. It's it's neat to have like those unique flavors popping up, and you had those ghosts walking past. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, is that wrong with your kids you know, too? But I, I love those ghosts that walk past you in the middle of the street, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. We're we're running up on that hour. I was going to say if there's a another show popping on after after ours. Um, so I don't know. I, if you're if you're good, Russ, I think we'll probably call it for the night. We usually don't want to keep people on too much. We appreciate you coming on and spending the time that you did, yeah. um, and getting us the great information you did. Um, I'm to come back. Oh, we'll we'll be happy to have you. Like I said, we're going to be going I'm through an alligator. Oh, oh, jeez. 
Oh. oh. Is it oh. in there, or did you at least get it out? Yeah, I see it on the top there. <clears throat> uh, well, I work somewhere that has a bunch of corks. <laughs> <laughs> I can fix that tomorrow, but I won't have any alligator tonight. Yeah, now I feel like vaguely yeah. responsible for that. Oh. Just like there, there was some excitement you could tell when you grabbed it. <laughs> Cork has no business in the modern spirits world or wine world at all. Uh, no, we I'm, agree completely. Yeah, we yeah. were talking about how you should almost all be synthetic yeah. and just, just because you could even. If you wanted to store them on the side, though, I wouldn't do it. I'm like, if you have to do it for a little bit of time, it's not the end of the world. Where yeah. You can produce a synthetic cork with the exact micron filtration aeration of natural cork. It's... I'm going to write hard peg about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I think we found somewhere. It's like one of your like mini pet peeves about the industry are these corks. Yep, natural yeah. cork. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're all on board with you on that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even when synthetics fail, they're still far superior. Yeah. I agree. Have you really had one fail? Yes. Oh, okay. I've, I, I've, I've, I've had the top separate from the cork itself, okay. and I've had it partially break off, but it's still so intact. You could pull it out with just about anything, a pair of pliers, use a corkscrew, whatever. I just but, haven't uh, had one But break. if a cork breaks... <laughs> It could be anything. You could have parts in there, all kinds of stuff. I just put a bottle of compass box spice tree downstairs with a broken synthetic cork. But yeah, it still works. I can still pull it out. Just yeah. cap kind of. Oh, spice me. tree. You're bringing up some excellent whiskey. I am yeah, totally <laughs> digging I this. Going, uh, I was ready to rattle off the 11 countries that I have whiskey from. <laughs> I, I could wait a minute. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by this. Uh, Canada, United States of America, Mexico, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, uh, 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 Japan, South Africa, mm. Belgium. Belgium, England. Where's Catalan from? Is that oh, Thailand, Taiwan. 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 So I mean, what's the South African one? Uh, it's terrible, so it doesn't matter. Okay. That's, <laughs> what am I saying? That's fair. That's fair. It was just when I was intrigued by when you said it. I'm like, I'm haven't heard too much of anything. Wine, yes, not not whiskey yeah. or anything Ooh, like, like that. You know, Taj. I'm sorry. What I was uh, South African wine. That I drink is Pinotage. Okay, that sounds okay. interesting. I'm uh, not typically a wine person. My wife is more so. Okay. There's some wine where I get I get a nasty headache, so that's why I switched over to like the more straight booze. I don't usually get a nasty headache or anything from from There's drinking it. Some weird hybrid cross these two grapes together that works very well in. Uh, oh wait, damn it. Did I say South America or South Africa earlier? South Africa. Yeah. Okay, good, yes. Uh, that's where Pinot Tosh goes very, very well. It's weird cross grape that only flourishes there, so. Oh, kind of has an earthy tar note to it. Yeah. Some, people, like it. Some people don't. <laughs> I, like, I think I like your palate. I'm like, I'm, yeah. I think yeah. I'm, I'm digging where your palate is headed. Earth, earth, tar, smoke. <laughs> all those things but but yeah um but yeah like i said we got another show coming up after us so i think we're good for the night um feel free to stay on a little bit afterwards we're just going to talk a little bit afterwards to everyone out in the chat thank you for stopping in emily aj um everyone who else was out there ice house uh whispering jeff ed yeah ed. Whisper, <laughs> whispering there was all sorts of people in there so appreciate you all stopping in for a minute and spending some time with us tonight Russ, thank you for stopping in. Um, everyone else out there, remember, it's not the size of them that matters. It's the love of whiskey. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Try them. Let's get into it. One, two, three.